All right, guys, welcome back to another episode of the Startup Junkies podcast. Um, my name is Davis McIntyre. I'm joined by my co-host, Jeff Amron. How you doing, Jeff? Glad to be here. It's Friday afternoon. The Hogs play Auburn tomorrow, and mm-hmm. I think we're going we're gonna to kick some War Eagle backside tomorrow, I yeah, hope. And yeah, I hope, I hope we're not eating those words uh, come Sunday. But we'll, well, yeah. We'll, you know, by the time this airs, well, the truth will be known, right? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Um, we might – be joined by Caleb Talley, our other co-host as well. Um, we'll just have to stay tuned. I think he's uh, stuck in traffic right now. So, um, But to, on today's episode, I'd like to welcome Jesse Randall. He is a tried and true uh, serial entrepreneur. Um, his newest venture, Sweater, allows the asset class of venture capital to um, historically been available to a select few, now open to the public. Uh, Jesse, how are you doing today? I'm doing awesome, guys. Happy Friday. Right. Happy to be here. Here. Well, well, give us a little bit more, Jesse. Give us kind of the, the, the Wolverine version of your X-Men origin story. <laughs> well, let me tell you about the end point first, and I'll tell you how we got here. Perfect. Right. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so Swear is a mobile app, uh, sort of like Robinhood, but it allows you to invest in a venture capital fund instead of into public companies, right? So it's your way to get into private venture backed companies. And typically that has been exclusively available to accredited investors, which means you need to have more money than most. Uh, Typical kind of line for that is making two or 300K a year or more, have a million dollars of liquid assets outside the value of your home. Um, So about 95% of the US is not accredited, which means none of us can get into venture backed companies. So um, yeah, we're delivering that as a mobile app. It's it's a very slick and smooth experience. You can sign up and and well, I guess it should say you will be able to sign up. Uh, we're launching here in a couple of months. Uh, be able to sign up about ten minutes. Uh, you can allocate. You know, um, I mean, typical allocations into a venture fund are usually a quarter or half a million dollars or more, uh, depending on the size of the fund. And we're making the the entry point five hundred bucks at the at the bottom end of this, so that literally anybody can come in. We want college students to be able to come experience it. Uh, we want accredited investors to come in, and even institutions to be able to participate in our fund structure. So the way we kind of explain it, it's sort of like you know we want we want people to be able to feel like they have courtside seats to the whole process. You know, um, like you come in, you got courtside seats, and you're a part owner of the team that's playing. And it just changes that feeling, right? Like you didn't, you don't get to go out and shoot the ball and you don't get to coach the team, but you get courtside side seats and feel everything that's going on. You get a tour of the locker room. And if you're really good, we'll let you be that kid that sits under the basket and goes and wipes down the floor in between timeouts. Um, you know, anything we can do to give you that feeling of being part and, and being there, right? Um, and it's interesting that, you know, people are excited about the opportunity to make money in a new way and especially in such an exciting category. But just as much, people have this desire desire to be entertained and you know they want something to brag about on the weekends and, and something to talk about with their friends and being an investor is an element of their personal brand and a little bit of status associated with it so there's a lot of cool elements that kind of converge in what we're doing and um, we're very excited to get this out in, in the hands of the public so so a question for you talk about how or contrast a little bit about how you're going to be different than some of the existing equity-based crowdfunding sites what's the nuance or the difference in the way you're approaching it yeah, so there's there are two things that came out. Uh, there's a lot of history there, but there's regulation crowdfunding or Reg CF for short, and then there's Reg A plus. Reg CF, you can raise up to five million dollars as a company from the public. Reg A plus, you can raise up to seventy five million. That's usually for bigger companies that are more established, and that's kind of like doing like a little mini IPO, just not on the stock exchange. Um, there's a lot of regulatory things around that and, and how you have to execute on it. So if you want to find a company as a consumer, you can invest in those companies and they'll be on platforms like Republic and WeFunder and Start Engine. And there's you know, probably two dozen of them now out there where you can engage with these companies. Um, in order to do that, there, there are a few big differences, right? Um, contrasting that with you know, being able to invest directly in a company with Sweater, where you're investing into a venture fund. And when you put money into a fund, it's all fully managed. You put the money in, we take it along with everybody else's money that's coming in. And then we go out and we find great companies and we, uh, we do deep due diligence. We're, we're experts in, in the markets these companies are operating in. We are with them during their entire journey to influence their, their management and their outcomes as much as we can to be helpful along the way. So when you're investing inside a VC fund, it's, it's a much more enhanced experience. And you're getting into companies that are only venture backable, meaning that 
VC funds are also all part of this process. When you look at equity crowdfunded companies, typically they don't meet the qualifications to raise venture capital money, which means they don't grow as fast. They don't have as big a market potential usually. Um, they're great businesses and I'm, I'm grateful that they have the opportunity to raise money this way. They just typically don't qualify to raise money from VC funds for, the, for you know, most of them. Um, and then when you go out there and you're looking at these companies, you have to do the due diligence yourself. You have to understand what you're getting into. Um, you know, you, you have to be able to pick in between them and, and know which ones are great opportunities and which ones might not be great opportunities. And then if you want to diversify your risk, you have to make at least 30 investments. And most people are only going to make a handful, maybe two or three, you know, and when you only make two or three or five or even 10 investments, the likelihood of losing all of your money in every single deal is actually pretty high. You really need to get that 30 number so that you diversify your risk and can actually get the outcomes you want. Where again, in a venture capital fund, we're gonna be investing in hundreds of companies. So you've already got that diversification built in just by writing a check. So call it the, the lounge chair version. Got it. No, I mean, that's cool. Investment. And then the idea that it's the, it's open to non-traditional limited partners. Do you use, do you use, still use the kind of two and 20 GPLP sort of structure or is there some change that you have in mind there as well? Yeah, so when you get into this world, um, even venture capital, right? Basically, the what you're authorized to do from a, a fees perspective is predetermined by the SEC. So in a for those that may not be familiar who are listening, uh, a traditional VC fund is run on a fee structure called a two and 20, which is a 2% management fee on the money that is committed by all the investors. So if it were a $100 million fund, that those fund managers would take $2 million a year to be able to run their operations right? And then pay salaries and all that kind of stuff that they have to do to run the company. Um, and that usually happens for about five years and it tapers off to close to zero. And the second half of that, the 20, it's called carry. So carry is carried interest, which is basically taking a percentage of the winnings that you create. So in that same $100 million fund, if over the course of a decade, those fund managers turned that into $300 million, then they created $200 million of new gains, Right. So the VC in, a, in, a, in the 20 part of that would be 20% carried interest. So they'd get 20% of that, that winning. So they'd take $40 million home. That's what they get for making good investments. So it's called a two and 20. Now, what we're doing is a little different. Our fund structure is different from a traditional VC fund. It's actually more akin to like a, like a mutual fund. It's kind of in the same category as a mutual fund. Uh, and because of that, we invest a little bit differently and we have a different fee structure. And ours is just a 2% management fee. But it goes on forever because this fund structure is evergreen, which means we can raise money into it ad infinitum forever, right? Uh, we could raise 100 million into it. We could raise 10 billion into it over 25 years. It doesn't matter. And so we take 2% of that the whole time. And that's, that's, and then we have like basic, you know, like it, we pay the legal fees for cutting the deals out of it. You know, we pay for marketing. You can do some of that stuff that also comes out of it that, that are additional fees. Gotcha. Super, super helpful nuance there. And is, you know, as you look at it, what you're planning to do. Is there a sector or stage focus? Are there some things in particular that you're going to zero in on as part of your investment thesis? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so um, again, a little bit of context here for those listening. Traditional VC fund, they usually raise money in advance in a set amount, like $100 million, like I said before, right? So you go raise all that in advance and then you go out and you start deploying that money and making investments in companies. Usually because there's a set amount of money, you're making investments in a set number of companies. And it's usually like, 30, you know, it might be 20, it might be 50, but it's somewhere in that kind of range, depending on that fund's thesis. And so within that, you kind of have this constraint. And so you pass on a lot of companies and you're going to make those 30 investments over like three or four years, or maybe even longer. And so a VC fund will get, you know, I don't know, I mean, a hundred pitches a month, right. And they're only going to make seven to 10 investments a year. So they see tons of deals and make very few investments. Um, with the way that we do it, it's different because we, like I said earlier, we can raise money into it forever, which changes the nature of how the portfolio works. We're not constrained to just 30 companies. We could make 300 investments. We could make 3,000 over a decade, right? So we're more like indexing the private venture-backed market in, in that regard. Um, and because of that, uh, the aperture of what we are examining is a little bit broader, right? The, the quality bar, you know, isn't dropping at all. We're just able to look at a much broader view of types of companies. So we can move a little faster, we can make more investments. So the way we define that with that context, the way we define it is we call it consumer touching. So it's it's anything that an individual person might encounter in their personal life at home or at work. 
So that could be direct consumer products. It could be the apps on your phone. It could be a marketplace you use to call a car. Uh, it could be uh, you know, the, the software you use at work for HR like Gusto or Slack, right? Could be any of those situations. If there's a solid touch point for consumers, whether B2B or B2C, um, we can be there and be involved in that. Got it. You anticipate leading deals? Are you going to follow? Are you going to syndicate? What's your, what's your posture going to be? A, a little of all the above. Um, yeah, that's the other. I mean, again, there are a lot of nuanced differences in between how we invest and how traditional VC funds invest. So um, we can actually invest into three major categories of deals um, or deal structure types, right? So we can do direct investments, which like you were saying, right, we can lead our own deals, which means we found the deal. We're going to put in a big chunk of money. We're going to bring our, our other VC friends to the table and we're going to make an investment, right? So we can lead deals. We can also co-invest and syndicate with other funds. And we have a very deliberate partnership program there. We've got a dozen funds already that we've got handshakes with that when they find a great deal that's consumer touching and we can be helpful. They write a $5 million check. We write a $2 million check and we'll run with them, right? Um, so we can do direct deal making in both ways, leading and following. Um, there's, and then we'll do that in early stage. So really seed series A, series B is where we'll play with that the most. And check sizes from 500K to 10 million, probably inside that area. But then we can also do um, what's called uh, secondaries. So this is where you're taking, you're buying shares from someone else that already has shares, uh, like in between rounds or like, you know, a founder leaves and they want, and he wants to take some chips off the table. He can sell or she can sell those shares to us on the side and they can take some, some chips off the table and take some, some money out of their own company. And that happens all the time. It's usually pretty informal. There are some marketplaces you can operate in now like Forge and uh, eShares, a bunch of other ones. And um, you, know, you can take those out and we can play inside those marketplaces. And that's usually later stage companies that are still private, but they haven't IPO'd yet. They haven't been acquired yet, but they're much, much bigger and probably names you'd recognize. And then the last category is we can actually invest in other VC funds as a fund of funds is what they call that. And we can allocate a portion of our funds uh, into positions and funds that already exist. So when we do that, you know, it might be a hundred million dollar fund and we write a $5 million check into it. Then every investment they make, we are indirect owners in every single company that they invest in. And that's a strategic area for us. Like, so if we're partnered with a VC fund, we may like strengthen our partnership by us actually investing in their fund. And then we'll also co-invest in the deals they do. So we get indirect exposure because we're LPs in their fund. And then we can also superpower their deals and write checks alongside them in addition to that. So there's a bunch of things we can do, but that's kind of the high level of, of how we'll play. And it's, it's really a lot broader than most of us. Awesome. Guys, I've been dominating all the oxygen. You, you uh, I appreciate y'all letting me slip in uh, here <laughs> in my Murphy's Law afternoon. Uh, Jesse, I'd be interested to hear you speak to, you know, how y'all identify strategic partners um, and how you go about bringing them into the into the organization. Yeah, are you talking about VC partners specifically? Uh, just like strategic partners, like with EY and some of the others that I saw on the website. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's so there's, I think, two layers um, of strategic partners that serve different functions for us. So there are strategic partners that help us operationally um, and they, they allow us to do to build this fund and run it and all that kind of stuff. And those those operational partners are um, extraordinarily important inside the regulatory world that we live in because we're held to a very high standard. So. Um, for instance, we are held to an auditing standard every year to make sure that every dollar that came in actually made it into our accounts, that we actually invested in companies, that money came back around, we distributed it correctly when exits happened. And we, we're held to a very high standard for that. So someone like E&Y is going to come in and make sure all that happened. Unfortunately, the SEC doesn't think it's a very trustworthy thing for us to audit ourselves. So we do have to bring in outside partners to do that. Uh, we've also got other partners that are behind the scenes, uh, that are fund administrators, and they're the ones that are actually tracking all those transactions as they happen so that we're not doing our own books. So um, everything that happens to the app is automatically relayed to this fund administrator partner. And they're the ones actually putting in the books and saying, you know, uh, Caleb came in and he invested $5,000 on May 27, 2022. And he's made su subsequent investments every month at $150 for these, these months and these amounts. It actually came in and like all that kind of stuff, right? So there's those types of partners and they're really important, right? So I think that operationally, there's a, there's a bunch of groups we work with to help us run the fund right and stay compliant and make sure that we're transparent and all that kind of stuff. The other side is really uh, more on the capital deployment side. Uh, and capital deployment, I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff we can do there, right? So partnerships range from those that just want to refer partnerships, uh, or like in, in a sense that 
they can refer deal flow to us like an accelerator program, right? They, they can't actually make the big investments themselves, but they got a lot of great companies coming through. So we have partnerships to always see all the companies that go through the programming. We've got VC partnerships that will co-invest alongside um, and make sure that, um, you know, we can be programmatic as possible in, in that partnership so that we can move fast and help superpower them. And that's a really interesting one. Like we're, we're going to be uh, partnering up with a lot of emerging funds or like earlier fund managers, right? Who might be on their first or second or third fund who are still getting their feet under them, right? In terms of establishing their credibility because they often um, face constraints um, in the size of check they can write. So someone that raises a $20 million fund and it's their first fund, which is pretty good for a first fund, right? 20 million bucks sounds like a lot of money, but in the VC world, there's a lot of constraints around that. So like in that example, um, they take a 2% management fee every year. That's only $400,000 a year to run a whole business, right? And so when it comes to paying the GP a salary and having an analyst or two, go out and do the work. And then you got to pay all the legal fees on top of that for cutting deals. I mean, 400 grand doesn't go very far. Um, and, and then on top of that, they got to make, you know, 20, 30 investments. And so when you actually work all those numbers backwards, they can't write very big checks. Um, so in that sense, right, they may be constrained to writing like $700,000 check in any given deal. So if they have a great company come in and they're like, we're raising a $3 million seed round and we really like you guys. But then the fund is like, well, we can only write a $700,000 check. And another fund that can write a $2 million check ends up winning the deal because they can be more aggressive. So what we can do is, you know, we vet this, this partner and say, you're awesome. This is your first fund, but we love your, your background. We love your, the emphasis, the strategic advantages you have in the market. And so when you're ready and you find a deal like that, you can write a $700,000 check. We'll write a $2.3 million check right alongside you. And we'll do it fast so that you can grab that deal before it gets taken up by somebody bigger in the market. And they miss out on deals all the time because they can't be aggressive enough. And, but you know, they have good deals in front of them. So that's like a good example of how partnerships might work as well. Hey folks, Jeff Amarine here. Thanks again for tuning into the Startup Junkies podcast. Steve Blank, the father of modern entrepreneurship recently called the book that Jeff Standrich and I wrote, Creating Startup Junkies, a must read playbook for anyone who wants to kindle innovation and entrepreneurship in their community. This whole idea of building sustainable venture ecosystems in unexpected places gives you the tools, the techniques, and the inspiration to do what we've done in Northwest Arkansas and Central Arkansas in your neck of the woods. If you'd like to find out more, check out creatingstartupjunkies.com. Thanks again. That's awesome. Jesse, if you don't mind, could you walk us through kind of how this idea of sweater formulated and uh, how it's come to be? Yeah, yeah, that one's personal. Um, so I've been working professionally in, in venture uh, and in the venture ecosystem broadly for about a decade. And my first job um, out of grad school, I worked for an accelerator. And this is when accelerators were hot. Everybody and their mom had an accelerator. Everyone was trying to build these things. This was back in like 2011, 12 timeframe. Uh, I mean, back then to give you a context um tech stars they had three programs they're running it was one in boulder one in seattle and i think one in new york today they have 50 programs around the world and they run 500 companies a year through that and so back then it was everything was earlier it was smaller y combinator was smaller 500 startups was smaller but there were a gajillion of these things out there and i got hired to help build one of these things so i remember studying all those guys and all that kind of stuff and i built that and ran a bunch of cohorts through it it was awesome um and that Accelerator ended up raising a venture fund and they sort of tied their shoelaces together in the way that they raised it. Um, there's, there's a lot of bad ways to raise a fund. And unfortunately, they uh, made some missteps. And when they came out, they, they operated kind of like a bad angel network. You know, they wrote terrible check sizes and they wanted valuations, you know, from 1997. And it was just kind of a disaster. And I was living in Phoenix, Arizona at the time for all this. So I, I've been waiting around for someone else to build a better fund in Phoenix because there's really no institutional capital there. And I finally looked at myself in the mirror and I was like, why are you waiting for someone else to do this? You can go build a fund. You have the ability to do this. So I started going through the process and was having exploratory conversations with, you know, anchor check writers and this sort of thing. And it struck me one day that I was not allowed to write a check into my own fund because I was not an accredited investor. And I was just beside myself. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm the guy running the fund. I, I'm, I'm making the decisions. How can I not put money into my own fund? And it's just the way it is. And there are ways that I could have gotten around it, you know, and, but I was mostly curious. I have a, a policy background of a master's in, in environmental policy and uh, has nothing to do with venture. But what it does did give me was the ability to, to dig in and understand the rulemaking process underneath agencies. And so I was very curious. I wanted to understand the, the, 
the, I guess, the structure behind where the accredited you know, requirements came from. And what the answer I found did not make me happy because it basically is very condescending and says, if you are not rich, then you are not smart enough and we should protect you from this. Yeah. And I was so upset as I understood the nature of that. And I was like, maybe in 1942, sure. Maybe in 1970, but today, for heaven's sake, if I am inside that category, I'm included in that, and this thing is archaic. And this needs to be, this needs to change. And so I had some good conversations. We poked around at, you know, looking for loopholes inside the traditional VC stack. And we looked at Reg A plus and Reg CF for the crowdfunding stuff, there's nothing there. And we got some breadcrumbs for a very different approach to it. And um, it took me two and a half years to have the right conversations with the SEC and finally got in the right door. And um, that was about a year ago now. And once we got the green light on what to do and how to do it, we uh, started attacking it pretty hard. And now we're almost here. When, and when do you guys launch? So we have a private beta that will open up the second half of Q4. Um, and then we're launching publicly in early Q1. Awesome. So today we have, um, I think we're up to 37,000 people on the wait list. Um, and we're picking fantastic. up three to 500 people a day. So it's, it's great. People love it. No, that's fantastic. And, and, and I have to say, these guys have heard me rant. I, I've been in nine startups, raised money, made money, lost money, written lots of checks, about 90 investments through the funds that I've helped run and individually. And the one thing that I go back to, and I don't care who hears me say it, is the amazing intellectual hypocrisy around the idea that we're not going to let well-educated, well-informed people in the, in the age of the internet invest their own money in private companies. And yet, there's nobody over here at the Oklahoma Arkansas border keeping people from taking a truckload of their granny's cash and burning it on the roulette table or on the blackjack table. The intellectual hypocrisy, hypocrisy there can only relate to one thing. And it's kind of like the Full Employment Act for lawyers and accountants that don't have anything better to do other than sit in a federal agency. So it drives me insane, insane. And I'm really glad that you guys have figured out a way to, to skin this because if you really want to change the way people invest and to get some of that money off the sidelines and to get some of that money in private companies before they become public, we need vehicles like what you guys are doing. So, so good on you for heading down that road. It's yeah, about time. You. Yeah, You guys is, have right? to be broker dealers as part of that. You have to be broker dealers. You have to have the, the uh, licensure and all that stuff. Or how, how do you deal with that part of it? Uh, we don't have to be broker dealers. Um, but we are under a different category called the public investment company. Um, and that's, okay. it's sort of like broker dealer over here that allows us to publicly advertise for our own um, uh, securities investments, right? And opportunities, we can do it for ourselves, but we can't do it for anybody else. That's where you need a broker dealer license to represent other people's securities. Yeah. But one day we'll probably get our broker dealer license so we can open up the funnel to do even more fun stuff. But, you know, one step at belt a time. And, belt and suspenders. Because I, I know, you know, in the past when we're casting around for LPs, we've gone to some of the wealth advisors and the other people that have all the licensure. And they're like, nah, we don't think we can. We can't direct any of our clients money towards you guys just because we're worried about the licensure. There's all these sort of mm -hmm. artificially uh, constructed oh, yeah. constraints. Yeah, but so two and a half year slog, it sounds like with the SEC, but you're close to being able to get through all that and get launched. Oh, yeah. Well, it's so funny because you talk to attorneys like oh, we had some some smart conversations. So like we poked around at all that, like because I mean, <clears throat> let me back up, and give you a little context. You guys want a little history? Don't sure. you know, fall asleep on me. OK, so um, all of this stuff started because of the 1940 Investment Act, the 1933 Securities Act. They yep. came out, you know, they, they were products of the Great Depression to protect people and all this kind of stuff. Yep. And you think of them kind of like a big umbrella. Every financial instrument you can buy into in the U.S., accredited, non-accredited, institutional, whatever, everything is touched by the 1940 Investment Act in some way, shape or form. And the way to think about it is kind of like as if, you know, there's like little silos underneath this umbrella that all represent different product types. They're all different fund structures and, and ways to invest money in, in securities, right? So venture capital is one of those. Venture capital was born in the 70s after Super Angels funded companies like Intel and Hewlett Packard in the 60s, and it worked. And they made tons of money and they looked at each other and said, hey, well, let's, let's pull our money together and we can do this more organized. Like there's a great opportunity here. But when they went to do that, 
their attorneys were like, oh yeah, there's this little thing called the 1940 Investment Act you have to deal with. And, um, and it was totally onerous. And they're like, my gosh, like we can risk our own money. We can't pool it. That's ridiculous. So they lobbied the SEC and said, why don't you cut us a break? We're big boys. We can lose our money. And they said, sure, that's fine, but you have to be a creditor qualified and you can only have a hundred people in a fund as a way to kind of like corral it a little bit. And that's how venture was born. So venture is its own thing. And over the course of decades, more of those things have been created and approved by the SEC. And they're kind of like prepackaged in a box. You got to follow this set of rules and then you can operate inside that world. So we were talking to people outside of venture because you talk to people in venture and they're like, oh, everyone's tried to do this and there's no way to get around it. And so we stepped away from it. And we talked to others outside of venture, but still under the umbrella. And they are the ones that pointed out and said, hey, there are dozens of these structures. There's got to be one of these that would allow you to take money from retail and invest like a venture capital fund, but without actually being, by definition, a venture capital fund, you know, by nature of, uh, you know, SEC definition. And that's what set us down this path. And it was so funny because like, we're going to be like, that's awesome. It was a good breadcrumb trail, you know, and we start going down it. And you talk to an attorney and they're like, oh yeah, you know, to do that, I think you probably should talk to someone at the SEC. And they like point to the building, be like, the building's over there, go talk to somebody i don't know anybody there but the building's over there and you know i was like well that's that's not helpful you know <laughs> he talked to more people and finally we got in touch with this guy who'd actually worked at the sec for five years and he came out and became a partner at a uh, law firm called brian kate and we talked to him and he's like oh of course you should talk to someone at the sec and there's the building but also check it out here's the map of the building and here's all the room numbers on, on every single office. And these are the names of the people in the offices and you should get these nine people on a call and then i think that'll do it and by the way, I'll make all the phone calls and make it happen. And it was just like night and day difference. And, you know, my feelings of having the right people to get you to where you need to go. I mean, it sometimes it takes a long time to find the right person. But when you do, it just changes everything. And so it did take a long time. And even after we met him and knew what we had to do, it took nine more months after that to get those people in the room and actually have the conversation so that we could have the back and forth and find the structure of the workforce. So it was a bit of a drama, but it did take two and a half years to get to that point. And it's been another year since then. Um, and, but I'm happy with where we're at. You know, I'm not gonna just on the SEC. It's just a big bureaucratic monster and it, it's nobody's fault inside that it moves so slow. Well, and, and congratulations on on fighting the good fight to get to this point. I mean, it's, it's a, what, once you, crack the nut i'm sure there'll be others that will rise up and follow similar models and if they do good i mean because it's gonna it's gonna provide more liquidity in the market it's gonna provide more access for investors it's gonna it's gonna i think change the perception that it's always uh that the same old group quite honestly that uh mm-hmm. that has to be involved yeah i totally agree and it's all of positive. I mean, like we look at equity crowdfunding and we're not equity crowdfunding by definition, but we're so grateful it's there. I mean, they help pave the road and and pave the mindset that it should be possible. And that, you know, uh, the consumer mentality of how to invest is changing, changing fast. I mean, like we felt the wind shift when the whole Robin Hood thing uh, and GameStop situation went down back in February. I mean, it was seriously like night day difference, one day to the next, all of a sudden everyone understood what we were doing. Yeah. And they're like, yes, it's not fair. I'm I'm not able to put my money where I want. That's crazy. And it's like, well, it's always been that way. Didn't, yep. didn't you realize that there were all these other things the wealthy can do that you can't? And like, they just weren't aware. And now that they are, I mean, I think that the next 10 years, we're at the front of a wave of yeah. innovation in, in finance that we're not even going to recognize the whole ecosystem yeah. 10 years from now. Well, especially with crypto and NFTs and all that rolling out, I, I'm sure that the the career regulator's head is about to explode over that because that's definitely a, a store of wealth that they're going to have a devil of a time regulating uh, just because it's so decentralized and, and, and growing oh, yeah. so quickly. I mean, I'm also grateful for that whole movement because compared to NFTs and crypto, that <laughs> wild west, I mean, we look like a walk in the park. Yeah. I mean, we're already using an established fund structure that's been used for 40 years. And yeah, we're applying it a little different but it's still got government oversight. I mean, like we're, we're the good kid in the family, like compared to the Yahoo that's out there, like, you know, shooting up the bar and having a good time. You know, you said you couldn't predict, you know, what's uh, what things will look like 10 years from now. What do you think, uh, you know, launching in early quarter one, uh, what do you envision, you know, in the next three years, five years for a sweater? 
Yeah, I mean, we've got big ambitions. You know, um, when you look at other indicators in the market, um, benchmarks, if you will, you look at like, you know, companies like Robinhood and I mean, it's fundamentally different, right? It's, it's a brokerage. Uh, you look at Acorns, uh, you look at Betterment. Um, there are others that are more recent, like Titan. If you've heard of Titan, they allow you to get into hedge funds. There's Yield Street that allows you into alternative investments and like art and, you know, stuff like that. There's Cadre that allows you into big commercial real estate like Skyrises. So there's a bunch that are moving in front of us that those last three that I listed, they've all raised over a billion dollars in the last, call it four or five years since they launched. And they were the ones cutting their teeth in this place. I mean, like you think that we're like, you know, breaking ground, they're really breaking ground. They had to tear down the forest first and work their way through it. And they've already got billions under management. Uh, Robinhood has 18 million users. Acorns has five or 6 million users, you know. So with all that context, we look at it and say, well, we want to get to 250,000 subscribers and uh, in five years. So uh, it, that's significant because part of what people can do is, you know, they can set up an account for 500 bucks or 50,000 or whatever, but they can also sign up for a monthly subscription and grow their position, kind of like your IRA, right? So throwing 50 bucks a month or 500 bucks a month, a couple of grand or whatever, um, which is crazy to me, you know, as, as a non-accredited investor, you know, I've got these doctors that come to us and we're like, hey, on day one, I want to throw in $100,000 and sign me up for two grand a month. You know, I make $800,000 a year and I don't know where to put this stuff. <laughs> and it's just like, that that's not my world, you know, but for them, they just, they want it taken care of. They, they want access to the class. You know, so, so all that said, like that subscription mechanism is really powerful for us. Um, so our goal is to have a billion under management in five years across 250,000 subscribers. And those 250,000 subscribers, we want in at an average of $100 a month. And when you extract Calculate that out, that would bring in 300 million a year of new AUM coming into our system for us to invest on an annual basis, um, which is kind of like raising a billion dollar fund every three years, which is kind of a typical VC fundraising cycle. So that's where we want to be um, a billion in five years, and we want to be 10 billion in 10 years. That's a super disruptive approach, and, and, uh, and I'm glad you guys are doing it. I mean, it's, it's exciting to watch, to think that it also remove some of the pain and suffering that you would have to have gone through if you'd gone to institutional LPs like pension funds, family offices. I mean, I'd rather be taken out and beaten than have to talk to too many of those groups as a fund manager. So I, I think you, this approach is just, it's, it's really insightful and it's exciting to see you guys doing it. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it comes with its own challenges, you know, I mean, um, retail investors, uh, you know, need a lot of education. You know, most sure. people aren't as familiar with the way this stuff works and that a lot of companies are going to fail in the portfolio. That's just, that's normal, right? It's, it's a game of mathematics and probabilities. You know, we have to make good investments, but you're never going to have all good investments. And so th there's things that we know we're going to have to manage. Um, you know, we plan on having a strong support system, you know, customer success portion of this. Uh, the goal is to always stay ahead of all that within the app by creating lots of education material, um, always be updating on, on the companies as things are happening, not just once a quarter or once a year, so that people feel like they're there, right? And we can preempt a lot of questions and things like that and have a lot of materials that can help them, frankly, trust us, right? I mean, at the end of the day, this is a game of trust. When it comes to money, people have to feel like you are going to be a good steward and they need to have correct expectations and all that kind of stuff. But then that's where it gets fun too. Like, it's like, I mean, you got a bunch of institutions institutional LPs and family offices. And, you know, they, they may have a few powerful connections or whatever, but they kind of tap out, you know, after a little bit. Um, but the great thing about what we're doing, I mean, you, you put a quarter million, half a million people into an app and we're not just going to let them sit there and feed them content for heaven's sake. These are the people that are buying all the products that our companies are making, right? So half the technology stack we're creating is a way for us to um, document and understand everything about our members as much as they want to volunteer, right? And it's like, you know, what they like to do on the weekends and their hobbies and where they work and what they do and what they specialize in professionally, but then also just the things that they manage in their life, the, the, the things that ail them, the things that they hope for, you know, like example I like to give is like, so my dad has Alzheimer's, right? My family is managing a situation right now. So if, you know, uh, we're looking at a company that has some technology that helps families manage, you know, uh, uh, Alzheimer's within their walls, right? We could go into our member base and be like, boop, 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 who said that they are managing that? Oh, we've got 17,000 people that have stated that they're managing a situation of Alzheimer's. Let's ask them some questions. How, you know, how do you deal with this? And what are you using right now? And you know, what do you wish you could do? And things like that, so that we can make better investments 
first of all, right? Mm -hmm. Then once we make that investment, now we've got 17,000 people that could be a great first customer and, and they're yeah. aligned with making this company successful because they're investors. Um, and so we, we intend to, you know, I, I don't want to use, sort of like weaponize it, right? Which sounds, it's kind of the wrong context, but to take advantage of the power that's there, right? And that's half the reason that we're making it an app. So it's sitting in your hand and, and you can help these companies find success. That's exciting stuff. Is it planes landing time, Caleb? Probably so. Um, Jesse, one of the, uh, I guess, second to last questions we always ask our guests on the podcast is if you have the opportunity to hop in your time machine, go back and past, um, you know, to, you know, well before you, you started this journey um, with the knowledge that you have now, what advice might you give your younger self? If I was talking to myself as an entrepreneur um, and taking sweater out of context, just saying, you know, like finding success as a, uh, as a founder, I would say freaking learn how to sell, learn how to sell rule. Number one, learn how to sell something because I was 33 years old before I learned how to sell. And I went through a lot of pain and suffering, both in employed environments, as well as startup environments, because I, was, I, I don't know if I was nervous. I mean, I love working with people, but I didn't, I didn't understand the context, the psychology and the process of helping someone to believe in what you're doing enough to take action and buy something from you. Mm -hmm. And if I could have understood that, oh my gosh, I, I could have built amazing things when I was 22 years old, but I, I didn't know how to do it. I was so obsessed with building a product and ideating and talking to people, and, but I would never sell. I would never pull it across the line. And if I could go back and just teach myself how to do that in my life, would be very different. I probably would have had a couple of very successful startups by now, frankly. Um, and that probably would have changed the most. On a personal basis, um, I think that I would tell myself to that I, I'm, you know, I'm already on the right track, taking care of family and making sure that family's first, because that's, that's where real happiness is at. I started my family very early. I was married at 22. We had our first kid at 24. And you, know, you get some flack from people for that sometimes because it's kind of non-traditional these days. And I would say, don't be afraid of it own it because that's where all your happiness is going to be rooted the rest of your life. Sage advice. And I could not agree more sitting here with four kids and four grandkids and kids in the house for 36 years from start to finish. Uh, uh, that's, that's a good orientation. Good on you. That's how a, a true measure of wealth is the, the, your family and friends. So that's really fantastic. So yeah, I was, I was, so that it's an investment in my long-term happiness. And that, it's not you know, I mean, it's, and it matters 25 years, but it matters a lot more than, than, you know, the number of Benjamins you stack up is how you feel about the people that are around you. But okay. back to capitalism for a moment, where can our, our listeners find out more about sweater and about you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so sweater, you can go to sweaterventures.com. Uh, we've got an active wait list. You know, we got a lot of fun content that we, we push out every week to help people understand what we're working on in the context of this world and teaching about venture capital uh, so we welcome you to join us there it's uh, it's really um it, it'll be a great part like a great journey to be there from the beginning from us you know with us so they can find sweater there um you can find me on linkedin if you just search jesse randall linkedin i'm probably the first one you'll find um and i'm pretty i'm mildly prolific on linkedin i probably post more than i ought to but you know i, I get enough positive feedback that i keep doing it so um anyone's welcome to come and, and connect with me there I, I love knowing where you come from so you know personalize your message and say that you, you heard about me on startup junkies i'll definitely accept your request i love meeting new people jesse thanks for coming on and we we enjoyed hearing about sweater and your journey and, and best uh, best of luck with the launch thank you yeah well we need all the luck we can get right <laughs> I'll be joining right. that wait list. <laughs> we'll see you. Take it easy. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. You bet.